Bye, everybody. This is Kathy L. Murphy, the Public Queen, and I'm here live at my little cabin in the woods in called Murphy's Law. And tonight I have a dear friend that we go way back. I, in fact, I won't even go how far back we go, but River <laughs> Jordan has been coming to our book club for decades. Okay, well, I said that. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> We have a million stories and we've been sharing them on her blog, our blog, The Public Queen Presents. She's out of Nashville. She has this radio, wonderful radio program, and she is a master storyteller. So what we're going to do, River, is I'm going to have, I'm going to change this to speaker view, and I'm going to have you give a little background on your life before we start talking about your books. Then we're going to discuss your books. And then we're going to open up for discussion. So right now, who is River Jordan? A mess, an absolute freaking mess. And the only way, you know, I think if there was a theme song to my life um, on any given day, there's so many things I'd choose, but I think I get by with a little help from my friends by Joe Cocker definitely has to be the, that's it. That's just that's it. it. Huh? Um, and it has been such a wild ride, but I have to say, you know, in, in dealing with issues and health problems and getting, you know, th just things, dealing with things. I was thinking today what, you know, and, I, and I'm not being morose, but if I died today, I was thinking what an incredible, magical, wonderful life I've had to be able to be an author, to tell stories, to connect with readers, and of course, my family and my grandbabies, you know, my they call me Zaza, is just been one of the most magical parts. And Papa Queens and the Timber Guys has been an integral, just just so woven in. I'm going to have to end up getting a tattoo that <laughs> represents my time. All your matching tattoos. Yeah, I know, matching tattoos. But I really have thought about what would that be. And I could do the little crown thing, but I also thought about doing like this, this green vine to remind me of how the public queens at one time was this wild and crazy event I went to and then became such a part of my life that it was like a tapestry, just this interwoven tapestry of friends and authors and memories and events. And um, it, I just treasure it. So, you know, you've been such a highlight from my first novel. You chose my first novel as one of your book club picks. And, um, you know, it, I think the experience has been life changing. But so I've been a writer all my life. I was discovered by my sixth grade teacher who thought that I would plagiarized something and brought me up to her desk and gave me the third degree. And then she said she realized I had actually written this thing and she called my mother to tell her your daughter is a writer and you know it's only after I've been an adult and in retrospect that I look back at that moment that this teacher this <laughs> sixth grade teacher felt like she had really discovered this this writer this talent this young writer who you know had potential and my mother you know, this private one-on-one -on -one meeting she scheduled just to give her this news. And I'm sure she was expecting my mother just to faint and fall out, you know, that she had this prodigy or something, right? And my mother just said, oh, that's so nice that she can write, but she's going to be a pharmacist when she grows up so that she always has a job and she has benefits. And my mother was very serious about that. So uh, I was a great disappointment to her in that respect. And um, God bless my mother and all the stories that she's given me and everything. So it's that's who I am. And although I've held other jobs, like from everything from waiting on um, tables, I love to wait on tables. I was a great waitress. I grew up in the restaurant. My mom was a manager of a restaurant on Panama City Beach, where I grew up. 
And I started rolling silverware when I was 11. And I started waiting on tables when I was 12. And I was such a darn good waitress and I loved it. And the restaurant was right on the beach, like on the sand dunes. You could see the waves and the water from the restaurant. And when I was 15 years old, my mom let me switch to the night shift instead of the morning shift. So I got to hang out with all the college kids, you know, <laughs> that waited on tables at night. And it just, oh my God, it just couldn't have been any better than that, you know? Um, Perpetual spring break, huh? <laughs> um, yeah, it was really hard work. She wouldn't have a closing time. She refused to lock the doors as long as people were still coming in. So sometimes at 2 a.m. we were still getting tables, uh, but it, it, it closed. That was back in the day when things closed on Labor Day on the beach. So it was great. You know, we worked our tail off and then we closed on Labor Day and we had the winter off and yeah, and then look forward to. So growing up on the beach as a teenager and getting a, having a perpetual tan and having the Miracle Strip amusement park that had the roller coaster and the haunted house where everybody snuck around as Virginia, we're in Virginia, you're in here somewhere, Virginia Dixon, she knows, man, she grew up with the Miracle Strip and that's where you snuck those first kisses when you were a young teenager and you were, you know, some boy that you had a crush on, you went into the haunted house that you walked through, you know, so uh, anyway, just lots of stories and and people are always telling me oh river you're gonna get such a great story out of this and i'm like i don't need any more of these strange life experiences to give me stories because man I, I you know i'm backed up uh, i've just got so many stories to tell so that's where i'm at i'm, I'm just still doing it you know this is my son calling hello son can't talk so um you know, I've got two boys, my two boys, and uh, who are grown men that we still call the boys. And so then I have uh, two granddaughters in North Carolina, and I have grandbaby boys that, you know, think I just walk on water that, you know, are right down the street most of the time, or they're, you know, in my house and hanging out, staying with me. And I have a brand new grandbaby boy. Uh, who's a ginger with total red hair and white, 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 white skin. And uh, they just posted a picture of his neck and butt in Hawaii, looking <laughs> out over the ocean, you know, and he's he's got his tennis shoes on and this little hat and his shades, man. Cute as he can be. And he's like a year, he's like a year, a little over a year old, a year and a half old, maybe. Um, Dimitri, and they call him Mitri. So life was good, man. Um, I'm just so happy to be here and happy to be with you guys. We are too. And I'm telling you, I didn't think you were going to get the book done. But when the minute I read it, I said, <laughs> oh, I, you know, I love all your books, but your stories, your stories are spectacular. I mean, you're a master storyteller. I could sit and listen to you for hours and I hope, hope you'll share the story about your cousin and the drawers because in the garage, that is my favorite story. Every time I think about, uh, and I, I, I know you weren't the one that said it. I'm trying to think who said it, but you said- uh, Actually, I was the one that said it. You always thought Shelly said it. No, you I'm talking about on being on the porch. Oh, I don't know. Uh, we, in the South, you said, I'm paraphrasing here, it said, we don't hide our crazy people away. We put them up on the porch and for, for display for all to see. And I, I oh, we bring them in. quote from you. Yeah, or bring them in and sit them down at the table, man. It's, uh, we definitely don't hide our crazy. Um, and our, our crazy is too, I, I don't know what you want. And I happen to be in the middle of a thing. So I can't help you. You're just going to have to hang, baby. Um, so big dog is in the house because it's storming and raining outside. So, um, Having the rest anyway. <clears throat> introducing. Uh, well, this, let me see if I can move my thing. Kevin, you want to say hi? I say hi. He's such a Kevin, mess. Kevin, I think of that Disney movie, um, The Boy Scout. Kevin, remember? Uh, this is with the older man and the no, balloons. Man. <laughs> uh, can't think of it. <laughs> no, 
<laughs> it's a wonder I can remember my own name and get up in the morning and find my way out. I'm just like, I'm, ah, I'm, it's I, called Up. It's the movie Up. Oh, ah, my oh my God. Up is such a great movie. And I it's know, I so Kevin. Cute. Kevin. Oh, I love Kevin. So. Yeah. Good name, good name. We all have pets. They jump around all over the place. Well, he just, he just, he's a, he's a rescue stray. We stole the dog from a neighbor uh, who was being like um, abused, and he always would come down and want to be my dog and hang out. And it was just pitiful, you know. He was such a mess, and he was left outside or he was chained up. And when my big dog Titan, my great Pyrenees that I had for 12 years passed away, my sister went up to the trailer where Kevin was and said, you know, we just want to take him to getting groomed because he comes down to our house and hangs out. And yeah, we took him all right. We took him to get groomed. We got his shots. We got him chipped and we never let him go back to the trailer. We stole him. That's a totally southern story there yeah it is it really is um yeah and one time after he was groomed they had never put him inside at all but one time i was like oh my god where is he you know i was looking for him i was calling him and he wasn't coming and and i told my sister who used to be a cop and was a gold badge detective i said i think they have kevin locked up inside she showed up in my yard. She walked up the hill to the trailer. She knocked on the door and she pulled the dog out. She said, don't you ever lock this dog up in here again. She's been looking for, it. I mean, it's just, and that lady was just standing there dumbfounded, you know, and just, you know, let, I mean, it was their dog. It was their dog. He was three years old. So oh, um, anyway, but that's it. Yeah, that's it. He's been my dog ever since. He's about eight years old now. River, tell us what made you write this book? Well, it, it, to be honest, you know, I've never written short stories. I've always written novels. And then I wrote Praying for Strangers and other books as well. I'm going to sneak over here and close this door so he has to accept the fact that I'm not cooperating with him. There we go. Uh, so maybe that'll work. But um, I decided to go back to school to get my MFA. And I tried to tell him I really just wanted to work on this novel that I was focused on. And they said, no, you have to write short stories. And I'm like, great. So I started writing short stories and I spent about three years getting the MFA because I had to take a year off taking care of mom and then some things, you know, so I had to, I had to do that. Um, and over the course of that, man, I wrote these stories and more stories than these. And then I realized I have all these stories and somehow Mandy got a hold of them or started reading some of them. And she was like, my God, River, you need to publish these stories, you know. And it had been so long uh, because I wrote Praying for Strangers. Then I wrote Confessions of a Christian Mystic. And the original title was Confessions of an American Mystic. And that's what it should have been. And then, um, and then I wrote The Ancient Way about going to Scotland and going to the Isle of Iona. And I just realized it's been so many years since my fiction voice, which I feel like is really, you know, my native tongue has been out in the world. And I also realized like, if I went to a publisher with these stories and wanted to get it published, it was gonna be two or three years before they saw the light of day. So I was just really so excited to, you know, to do this and get the stories put together. And uh, Mandy was such an inspiration with Walking the Wrong Way Home and Sharp as a Serpent's to Tongue. Sharp, Mandy, correct me. I don't want to, I read the book. I get it. Serpent's, Sharp as a Serpent. Sharp as a Serpent's Tooth and tooth. other stories. Yeah. Okay. So uh, she was such an inspiration with those books and the beauty of them, the beauty of the covers, the, the quality of the stories that I was like, okay, you know, Mandy is really 
set an example here, you know, for me to move forward and do this. So, um, and I'm so sorry, guys, I am going to have to sneak out. He's whining at the door. I got to go. Look <laughs> go, go. So I just, just talk amongst yourselves. I'll be right back. Okay. No, I, I just want to tell everybody that, um, you know, I've been with River lots of times where we've sit around and told stories. And to me, this is her genre. I know she's written fiction. I know she's written nonfiction. But when she wrote this book, I was like, this is so River that if everybody doesn't read it, I, it's just fantastic. It's fantastic. Well, and it's such a mix. It is. You know, it's such a mix of stories. Like, there's some crime in there. There's some noir in there. There's southern like gothic fiction it's it i yeah when i was reading a couple of them and i was like damn where were you gotta put these in a collection do it, do it do thank it. you mandy because it's absolutely fabulous so we're talking about you River. okay i'm gonna put you back on speaker well we can we can open it up we can open it up so if everybody wants to have make a comment or anything so i, I know a lot of people are sharing their favorite stories in the book i mean how do you pick one they're all so great um, um, but I did not know this was what you were working on when you're working on your MBA, but, uh, congratulations because I know just how hard that is. Yes, you do. And, <laughs> I about killed myself when I went back to school. So, uh, uh, congratulations on that. I'm thrilled for you, but, um, this is wonderful. And I, I cannot stress enough how exciting, um, it was to finally get to read it. So um, what was your favorite story, Kathy? You know, you're not going to believe this, but um, I think the very first story, I just, and I love that you wrote all this stuff in it. I just love, and I don't know, had you told that story before? Um, I just was trying to remember if it seems like some of these that I heard in here or maybe some of the ones I want to know what got left out too. What have you left out of this book that I are you going to do another one? Okay, I I can tell you buried 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 I can never say that word right. Uh within the pages of this book or probably four full length novels. Um so the first story that you read will actually be the first chapter in a novel called The City of Truth. Oh boy, and, oh, good, 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 good. The character Sugar Baby and the stories related to Sugar Baby um, are actually years later and Ruth and, and this lovely sexy time that she has, um, you know, in the first, in the first story uh, results in her uh, getting with child and sugar baby is the child that is the um, the union that happens and that oh Mandy look at you you didn't even know that you didn't know no, no I did not know that but I just, you know so I've been but here's a little thing I told Rip I said you've got to get this in EPUB like an ebook too because there are a lot of people that want them on their e-reader blah 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 I've been converting them this week into uh, EPUB format so she can publish an ebook. And my favorite is a favorite is a Mighty Grace, which I want to talk to you about. That, that. seems like a lot of people oh. like that one the best. Yeah. But as tell. I'm now, as I'm going through each story and like, you know, now formatting them again to because it's a it's a whole different world when you go from print to digital. Um, I'm like, oh my God, I forget how much I love truth be told. Okay, and then I got this, oh, war, I cried again. You know, and I've read these 15,000 times and, you know, going back and forth with you, making sure we got everything just right for this. You know, um, <laughs> The Light in the Window is such a short, sweet, simple one, but it's so powerful. Um, and Glorious Hanging of Good Molly Brown. And that's what River thought would be my favorite. And it's, it, I love it. Every single one of them is my favorite. They're priceless. It's hard. And, oh. But you know what? You. I'm going to give you um, um, what this remind me of is one of my favorite authors I, I got to meet, and he was the most loveliest man I've ever met in my life, uh, was Larry Brown. And if you do, have you read Faye by Larry yeah. Brown? 
Father yeah. and Son is one of my favorite <laughs> books of his. But you you have that same Silas House, Larry Brown. You've got uh, Ellen Gilchrist. You've got this definitely Southern Gothic, you know, way. But you have your own voice, River. Um, where each one of the people I just mentioned had their own voice. Uh, you know, I, I'm really excited because I think later on when I'm long gone and I'm up in the library in the sky, I'll look down and you guys are going to be the contemporary greats of our era. So um, <laughs> I, I'm serious because, um, you know, Carson McCullers and, and, you know, Eudora Welty, you know, when they were writing these stories, do you think they had any idea how they'd be so revered later in life you know um, or f scott fitzgerald who had like 20 dollars when he died in his pocket that he borrowed from his editor i think you know i love f scott fitzgerald but i but i really i'm so excited about this book i cannot say it enough thank you thank you kathy i was concerned when you say larry brown that that grit that is the true south right well, that's his that's his take no, no, but I have, I have grit as well, you know, and like you said, it's, it's my own voice, but I was concerned about people that have read some of the novels that were different, the Jane Girls, like A Mystery Set in the Everglades, and, and uh, The Messenger of Magnolia Street is just, to me, an incredible novel about good and evil and saving the stories that must not be lost and you know saints in limbo was my mother's favorite you know and just all of all of them hold a place in my heart but i was thinking about the readers that read those books and then and then all the readers that loved praying for strangers and i went on speaking yeah. engagements for three years about that and then them discovering this and going, oh my God, she's backslid into the darkness because oh no, I because have to tell they you, have that this is this is my favorite book, and I loved all your other ones, but this is my favorite, and that's why I think people need to invest in an author's body of work because to see you go from nonfiction to fiction to short stories, uh, I hate it when people say an author needs to be in one box. You know, because I think there's, you know, if you're gifted and talented in one thing, you can be an artist like Mandy, or you can be like Deb with her beautiful rocks that I just want one so bad. They're just absolutely little gems. Uh, I can't even imagine how much time those take to paint. But I think um, I think this book is is important, and I hope they have you everywhere across the country. Um, I do. Well, Kathy, it is funny though. I want to say, with, okay, when when we were working on these stories, when we we're putting them in, River and I would talk, you know, when we were doing different things, working through it, and she would say, "Oh my God, Mandy, is this too much? I gotta warn the readers. I gotta warn them." <laughs> right, right. Or oh, he's always going, "Oh my God, I gotta warn the readers. I gotta warn the readers." And last night, I had a, a book club meeting where somebody said, look, I just got to be honest, Civil War creeped me out. I loved, and, it. I um, loved it. I, and I was like, and why did it creep, creep you out? And she goes, because of the ending. And I'm like, I know. Just, the ending creeped me out too, but it was, I wanted so much for those characters to elope, escape, go west, live happily ever after. And when I was writing the story, I knew in that moment it it could not happen. It was so intense and it was it, it was so life and death and it was just by a thread. And I think it's a beautiful story, but you know oh, I and it, it captures powerful. what war does to you. Yeah. And it, it just, and, it, and that's what civil war is. You know, it's like, if you could only get to that moment where you can see the future or find agreement, but you know, you, you don't. With everything that she had been through, it was such an honest, raw, because I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna lie. And like I said, I've read them 15,000 times. I for, when I formatted civil war, I got to that one. I think that's the one I stopped at because 
it just took my breath and it's like and I love this woman and it was so sad it's so, it was so sad and I woke up from a dream years ago with that guy's voice saying you're not gonna and I, I'm paraphrasing myself now but you're not gonna kill the man who's the father of your children now are you I carried I carried that line with me for years and I had always hoped it would be a story where they ended up together. And I never knew until I started writing it, the intensity of the desperation and the situation and, and how scared and strung out she was. And when he said, I don't want to hurt you. And she was thinking want to and won't are two different things. Are two different things. And comes back with father, you know, father, and she was like, I ain't got no kids. And father was a foreign word to her. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he yeah. thinks he's like, you know, but he was, he was, he was all that. It, and but it was just and she then did the, not know that was a whole other world to her. No, and the beauty of him seeing his death before it happened and, and just him lying in her arms and her holding him and crying. And that was actually, you know, people said you don't see that. And I'm like, Yeah, you do. She's he saw it, you see it. And that's what happened. You know, so read it I again. Love it. Just read it again. <laughs> yeah, right. Read it again. <laughs> right. I love you the know. line. It doesn't oh. have to be that way. It doesn't have to be this way because that's what we say about all the conflicts in our yeah. lives now and in any war. It doesn't have to be this way. Or a divorce. I mean, I went mm -hmm. through what I consider the great divorce, right? And uh, <laughs> you're always thinking, Man, only with a slight turn, it didn't have to be this way. I mean, exactly. you saw that whole future of what might have been always, you know, always. So, and not every but, story has a happy ending. That is true. Doesn't, especially not during times of war, uh, and and times and times like that. And uh, so, I'll tell you one of the most fun stories to me in the collection is priceless. Uh, the ghost story in the graveyard where he's scared and he's fainting his aunt shows up and the <laughs> preciousness of their conversation and their relationship oh my god it just that to me is probably the most fanciful and lighthearted story in there and uh i love that a reader uh louise i want to say louise tucker but um she was re reading it to her husband and every night she would read a different story to her husband. And so his favorite was Priceless and also A Muddy Grace were his two favorites. And I thought that was precious that she was reading to him. And she said Priceless was the most fun story to read out loud, you know, so oh. it was just, it was fun to write. Do you you the the setting? Got hand raised. We've got Betty up with her hand raised. Oh, oh. Betty. Betty's okay, Betty. Okay, that's okay. She kind of, uh, River kind of answered my question about uh, the Civil War ending. Did you intend to end it that way when you started or did you tweak it? And so you kind of answered that, you know. I didn't intend to end it that way at all. It was just the deeper I got into the story. I saw what was, I was inside the character and inside the characters and I just saw the way it was going and there's a part of me going oh no no pull out pull out go the other way fall in love you know and she does she desires him you know and she's she's confused by that so um anyway no I, I well, never planned and, it and Mandy I have to tell you she did kind of prepare people especially when she did my class she told them that this was coming out. And I think it came out the week that you did the class or the week before it, you did the class. Anyway, she said, now I'm going to tell y'all, this is me. <laughs> and she <laughs> said, it is wild. It is crazy. It is, it is a little it's bit dark. sad. It's, it's a little bit funny. It's got it's some dark stuff in there. Well, and would they tell still me, wanted to a, read it. <laughs> when she said, I've got to warn them. I said, no, you know, let them just let them love it because they're okay. They might be surprised. They might be shocked. They're not going to be offended. They're going to love them. Yeah. They might be shocked. Two questions. 
Kelly, Kelly, I have to tell you, I saw you posted on the chat. I haven't checked that for everybody. Um, I, I want them at Civil War, I want them to have such a happy ending so bad that I am strongly considering writing like, you know how there's the multiverse is such a popular thing now, you know, that I am, <laughs> I am really thinking about, I think I'll write that story again with, I'm just going to force a different ending so that we have the flip side of the coin, you know, we have like multiverse. choose your own adventure. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> choose A, B, C, or D. Yeah. <laughs> two, two questions, River. Do you read aloud your stories out loud to hear the voices? First, that's the first question. Second, do you get ideas for conversations from hearing things? I listen to eavesdrop to people all the time at the doctor's office today. <laughs> I heard this man who's living off the grid ask the receptionist, he said, you, or he made a statement, he said, you know, now is the best time to be a ventriloquist. And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> I thought I've got to use that in a story because I thought, where in the world did that come from? How can you why not get a story out of that, right? Know, why would this be the best time to be a ventriloquist? <laughs> I was laughing, but I had, my, to yourself. I had my mask on, so but my shoulders were going up and down and I had to leave. Uh, but anyway, do you do you listen to people's conversations? And um, you know, I don't get out much. Uh, so well, you have uh, in the past. I'm, I'm okay. running through the titles right now so I can so I can okay, so I can uh, truth be told, man, I was carrying that around, but that was a breakthrough story because. One of the reasons I went back to get my MFA was uh, because a young boy that I was teaching writing to high school age, this group uh, writing uh, program, he had this little novella publishing, dedicated it to me, and I didn't even realize this. And he said, because River Jordan has taught me writing in a way, opened my eyes to story in a way I've never seen before. And that was the day I contacted the school to see if I could enroll to get my MFA so that I would be able to teach at the university level. I, I mean, I immediately, when I saw that dedication, did that. And the other reason was because it was just unfinished business. I mean, I, I became a mother at a young age. I did go back to school. I was, I was in theater and studying playwriting and journalism. And then it theater really captivated me and I totally went theater playwriting, but um, I did not finish that degree. And I really would have gone on to get my PhD and teach. That's just a part of who I am and my personality. And so it was unfinished business, but I knew that there was something about this novel that I'd been starting for years and I would always like put it away and write another novel. And then I think, okay, now I'm going to go back and write The City of Truth. And then I would write a little bit and I'd put it away and write another novel. And it was, it was just like it was something a little bit bigger than I was capable of doing that I just wasn't good enough yet, even though I'd been writing for years, you know, years. And, and then one of the mentors that I had in the MFA program uh, I submitted a story related to Sugar Baby and to, you know, the story. And he was like, oh, my God, you've got this and you've got this, this, you know, man living down by the river with one eye. And you've got, you know, this, you know, what is happening? And he was like, you've got to, I don't know what's happening, but you, you have to write this. And somehow, and it was like in the middle of the night, I woke up and realized I have to let Ruth talk and never had I allowed, it was always sugar baby years later looking back, but I had never allowed Ruth to have her day, her years, her story or her voice. And it was a, it was totally a breakthrough moment, a breakthrough story. And so that's where that one came from. The Seven Sisters of Trouble Road. I live on Valley View in Cheatham County. 
and I'm the first house on Valley View, but they don't deliver pizza to Valley View Road for a reason. Because <laughs> as you drive farther down Valley View, they're like, we don't go down there. And I would always go, but I'm the first house on Valley View. And I'm like, I'll meet you down the road at the stop sign. And look at the phone. No, we don't meet nobody, ma'am. I'm like, damn, can I just get a pizza? You know, so uh, oh, no. as you drive down Valley View, the next road that where you can turn right or something is Trouble Road. And, um, you know, Trouble Road is named Trouble Road for a reason. And the cops get called out to Trouble Road for a reason, you know. So you kind of just don't want to go on down that way. You know, I tell people, when you come out of my driveway, just turn right. Don't turn left. You know, hey, if anybody's watching that lives down Valley on the other end, I love you people. You're all good. I feel a little safe. I'm just saying, I'm just saying, you know, people don't need to be pulling up your driveway at night. You know what I'm talking about? So, you know, you just don't want to go down there. So when I heard that there was a road called Trouble Road, I was like, oh, hell yeah. We're going to have a story with Trouble Road in the title. And uh, so then it, just the Seven Sisters of Trouble Road came to me. Also, a really fun story to write because it had this sing song fairy tale quality about it. There was something about the rhythm and the language and the characters that just was like this fairy tale, you know, even though it ended the way it ended. And I've always felt like it's a wonderful story. If you've ever felt like somebody in your family was wronged and you wanted to do justice where justice had not been served correctly, I always felt like, it was a cathartic story for people like that that needed a little justice in their lives. It's like, just read The Seven Sisters of Trouble Road and then uh, it'll all be, you know, it'll all be well. Night Moves is, a, that's a sexy story, man. It's a sexy opening. And that is related to the gravity of galaxies. Of course, that's the sisters. And I could see writing, a, you know, even if I don't do, a novel with the sisters, I could see writing a collection of stories that's just those sisters and different stories about their cheater service and, and them, you know, following people and what happens in their lives. Um, and then, of course, Civil War, we've talked about the light at the window. Um, man, it's such a short story, but Mandy, you did it right. You said it right. It's a powerful, there's something really powerful about that it's so quiet and yet it it possesses that gravitas of the supernatural it captures that moment that you cannot explain not just experiencing you know something um just beyond the natural and particularly the beauty of a man who is so so just grounded in the earth and a hard worker and a simple man and who who just believes in in uh, uh working hard and loving his family yeah and then he experiences that so uh the inglorious hanging of good molly brown man the title came to me before anything else and and then her hanging herself and falling and then it, what a fun story, ultimately, and really one of the stories that has the most hopeful ending other than priceless, has that most uplifting sense of wonder with the stars and these three strangers finding each other and being, you know, in this parking lot at night and her getting this crush, you know, uh, on this man who's stitching her up. And I love that she doesn't want Violet or whatever, the little nurse, you know, the skinny little nurse. She doesn't want her stitching her up. She wants, she wants the guy doing the stitching, you know, um, scorched, man, scorched is tough. It is, a uh, you know, just, uh, it's probably from a literary standpoint, one of the best stories in the book, if it was just studied, uh, you know, you know what I'm saying? If, if you pulled them out and, and somebody who taught literature was studying, uh, I think Scorch would be one that, that stood above the rest. And it was the one I read for my, for my graduate reading. 
um, and, and so I, it's special in that way. And they absolutely loved it, you know, and I discussed it with my last mentor, you know, about which story to read and Scorch was one of his favorites. And are a muddy. You gonna, are you going to read anything tonight? Sure. Whatever you want me to read. What anybody want to make a comment, Mandy? Well, so I just want to say before before we well, if Susan was next, Susan oh. has a question. Well, I don't know. Robert, thank you so much for keeping us in order. Nobody's paying attention. <laughs> now you're you're doing a great oh, job. Thank you. Oh, that's sweet, Robert. No, I was thinking about River's voice because that you know I've known River for gosh twelve years now. I took you to I've your loved first. Her. I took you to your first PW Queens oh, okay. weekend. Yeah. That was in 2010. That was in 2010. We had known each other for Thank a year. Thank you for reminding me. But, yeah. but, but River's voice in her spiritual writing and in her fiction are pretty different, which is wonderful the way she does that. Though you, if you know her, you can't help but hear this, uh, this one and this one at the same time. So there's a person I've thought about, and I wonder, River, what you think about her because uh, I see some similarities. Haven Kimmel, I don't know if you've read Haven Kimmel's work. She was a decade ago, the solace of leaving early. Um, uh, I forget the names of some of her others. Oh my and God, like I her work. And I, she, and also I... wrote, she also wrote memoir like Mary Carr. Her memoir was gritty like Mary Carr's, but her fiction- Did she write a college of you know, a cracker childhood? Yes. One of the uh, best damn books ever written, man. Yeah. Yes. She, got up, she got up off the couch and I forget the other one. But her fiction, The Solace of Leaving Early, um, I mean, she's got these two little girls, Immaculata and Immacu somebody, you know, <laughs> who see the Virgin Mary. She's got some of that in there, but it's also dark. And you do a different kind of dark and gritty from a Larry Brown because you're a woman. That's but it's right. still got the Southern War and the gritty. I just wondered if you knew Haven's, Haven's work because it's a, if y'all like River, you would like Haven Kimmel. I met her, but it was a decade ago, and I don't know if she's written recently. Iodine. Right? Generous. I met her years ago at a festival, yeah. and she's as amazing and generous in person yeah. as she is on the page. Yeah. The Ecology of the Cracker Childhood is one of my top 10 nonfiction books of all time. It's a memoir, yeah. but it also, every other chapter, one is about her growing up in her early age. They lived in a house in the middle of a junkyard. And the next chapter right. will be about the longleaf pine and its disappearance in the South and about the ecology of the longleaf pine. So anyway, I won't, I won't go off too much, but you're, that's such um, an honor for you to mention. I mean, for Kathy to mention me in the company of, you know, Larry Brown and Silas House and, you know, um, you know, and for you to say having Haven Kimmel, I don't know how to say your first name correctly, but. Um, That's it, Haven, Haven. Mm -hmm. Haven yeah, y'all have both right. been really inspirations to me with your voices, which are so distinct and so both dark and colorful at the same time. So kudos, just wanted to mention that. Well, thank you. And, and a point, a point about that is the City of Truth is probably one of my darkest, you know, that starts with Truth Be Told. There's there's a, such a sense of shadow and foreboding and, and sultry and sexy. And, you know, the, it's just so deep south. And, and then of course scorched and the other one was sugar baby is sugar baby right it's just sugar baby uh, but it's it's probably going to end up having the greatest reflection on faith and the power of forgiveness and redemption of anything I'll ever write so I you mm -hmm. know I think it will be a serious blending of those two things ultimately you know and i also want to say yeah. river that you you're even though i mentioned larry brown and mentioned silas and you are a a standalone i mean your voice is so strong and true you are a favorite amongst the pulpwood queens i mean i've already heard from my chapter 
that you spoke to last night and they were just like river you know and I, I it's really neat to see that kind of you know fan worship you know uh through the years of you coming to girlfriend weekend and and um but um anyway but I'd love to hear you read because you have such a great voice well, Robert has something real quick. Yeah, well, so I just wanted to share, well, first of all, I wanted to share what I felt was the most lonesome paragraph in the whole collection. Okay. And then I wanted to share with you my two most favorite sentences in the whole collection. Please, please. please. And, and please I love please. and I love this masculine voice. <clears throat> it was the slide guitar that called him, the sound crying, spilling out onto the sidewalk, thrumming up one side of his heart and down the other. He picked up his feet, followed the notes, and before he had the good sense to stop himself, he stepped inside the bar, stood there in the warm, dry air, surprised to suddenly find that he was indeed inside and their pretty people were sitting at tables before him. He stood unsteadily next to the stage by the door, the band playing on, and he didn't know what to do next. That's just, that's just, oh, it's just so lonesome. And, and, and that masculine edge, that masculine voice. Now, these two sentences are everything. <laughs> that morning he had woken so cold and wet that he and the sensations were no longer separate things. He was the cold and the cold was him. And they had become a thing, a new thing entirely. I mean, I could just listen to that all day long. Isn't that lovely? <laughs> yeah. can i can i say my favorite two sentences oh please please yes, I'm, 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 gonna, I'm gonna go to sleep tonight like a little lamb just floating <laughs> on a cloud of happiness and goodness and it's been such a rough day to be honest with you oh, oh that's just good then you know i got a uh i had an mri come back you know and and just have a little some back issues and so you know it was i text mandy like damn you know and um so it's just so sweet to be with you guys this evening it's extra special oh. well i so, know that yeah. feeling yeah. about the mris can i read just two sentences from the oh please i just love and a lot of your writing feels like Hemingway to me for some reason, but maybe that's- I love Hemingway. But, well, and but, a reviewer once, it was so funny because a reviewer once compared me to, uh, it was like Faulkner and Hemingway at the same time, yeah, which is so such an odd connection. Oh yeah. But your feeling for the landscape and the scene is so powerful. And you know, not everyone does that. And, these two, these two lines were so beautiful. The pines whispered as we went along. It's a lovely singing sound not made by any other tree. And the sky came down toward us in pieces now, sheltered from the green needles. Whoa, so beautiful. That's lovely. It is. I, ha I have to have the world in there. And, uh, and when I teach writing sometimes and, and I read somebody's work, I'll say, it just needs more dirt in it, you know? Yes. It, uh, yes. Give me more dirt, give me more land and breath. And um, Robert, I wanted to get back to that story. I love writing in the masculine voice. I loved writing the two brothers in the Messenger of Magnolia Street that were the main characters. Um, to me, there's just, no difference and all the difference and a slight difference, you know, but when you're a writer, you are a shapeshifter, you know, you totally step into those other places. And I've written stories where men are talking about women and it's just, you, you just shift shapes and you and you go there and some of the, the most wonderful comments I've gotten are been from men who are like, Oh, I didn't think I'd like this because you're a woman. And I thought it was going to be like chick lit, but these are such <laughs> great stories. And, you know, I really like them a lot. So uh, in my time of dying, you know, we we're talking about how stories get inspired. And Kathy, this was one that was totally inspired by a true story from Facebook 
where the guitar player got up that morning and he said, this is still haunting me and I hate it. And this is what happened last night. A homeless man came in and requested a song and he put his last dollar in the tip jar and the manager came up and kicked him out before he could hear his song. We just started playing and he jumped down, excuse me, it was downtown Nashville and he jumped down, got the dollar out and chased the old man down and gave it back to him and kept saying, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. And he went back up you know, and made himself start playing, but his whole mind, you know, the whole time he's thinking, do I tell the band, screw this, let's throw our instruments down, you know, and, and book. And he didn't name the place because it would have become like local people would have just descended on the bar in Nashville that obviously had become a tourist trap, you know, or was someplace that was posing you know, and not like the original Roberts downtown on Broadway that I recommend, you know, which is a true local hangout and a, a real bar. And, um, you know, and, and it haunted me so much that story and his hurt and his anger that finally I had to write the story to, you know, to set it free from myself, you know, and I don't even remember the guy's name. I didn't save the post, but I've always hoped the story will find its way back to him. You know, it's it's almost like helping him express that pain that he felt. So yeah, uh, but thank you for loving that story and the, and the word. I loved it. Oh my gosh, yeah, it, it's a favorite. Thank you. Robert, say what you just posted. Yeah, say what you just posted. That's beautiful. So I just say, so River's writing is not grit. It, it's raw edged silk. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Okay, good. I can, I can tell you a funny thing that Claire Fullerton, uh, one of your authors said to me uh, one time, um, she said, you know, Reverend, you may struggle financially all of your life, That's right. which I have. And uh, she said, but your grandkids are going to be loaded. <laughs> <And I'm> like, <laughs> That's so funny. Thanks a lot, Claire. I'm so glad. They're be I hope I can say the same. Okay. Uh, yeah. oh, here's to my grandkids being loaded, you know, but it's all right. Cheers. And because tell tell what is going on with Money Grace real quick. I got I'm, I'm still listening, but I gotta do something. You gotta hear something or do something. You gotta go somewhere. Money Grace. Okay, okay so um, the editor that I loved working with on the Ancient Way, one of the best editors I've ever worked with in my life, and reminds me of a, my original uh, playwright mentor director Yolanda Reed. Dr. Yolanda Reed, just a genius, a genius. A guy, I was so fortunate that God brought her into my life as a writing mentor. And um, so she was contracted by Brand New Imprint. And, I, and so I, uh, I won't be able to officially release the name and everything for a couple of weeks, but uh, they were looking, a Brand New Imprint that are, that, is publishing fiction um, and small independent, uh, independent, but are very respected independent publisher. And so I sent her the collection and said, well, if there are any stories in here that they would like for me to develop into a full length novel, other than the first one, A City of Truth, I won't commit that to anyone. That's my babe, I'm my golden egg I'm sitting over here with. Uh, so uh, they, loved A Muddy Grace and they want me to develop it into a full novel. So it is due in August and they are fast tracking it in hardback and it will be out in the spring of 23. And they're so excited Congratulations. about it. Thank you. So there, I just love their enthusiasm, right? And I'm so excited to be working with her on it because she's magnificent, you know, truly. Uh, so that that's great news. And Without the collection, it wouldn't happen. You know, if I hadn't to put this out, I wouldn't have had that collection to send to her. And I remember, you know, working with Mandy and I was like, well, how many stories do we have? You know, how many pages do we have? You know, well, is it gonna be too long? 
And so the last story I decided to include was a muddy brace and, and it made it into the collection. And then that was, you know, that was the end of it. So, um, all right, so we have to decide. We don't have to leave. I mean, God knows I can tell stories all night and talk all night, but- um, Can I say one thing? I just want to tell people how, so I've known you, I met you through the National Writers Meet at Brief that I was in like years and years ago. You came out. Right. Yeah, and then um, when we had our panel at the Southern Festival of Books, Clear Story Radio was there. You interviewed one of our writers and she mentioned, I was the only writer she mentioned by name. It blew my mind. And so I was, you know, so what, 12 years ago? I don't know. But um, when I quit my job and decided to write, like my life was crazy and I was living on that farm out in the middle of nowhere, didn't know what I was doing, had no money. You had a class. People don't know, a lot of people don't know that River does these great writing classes. She contacted me. I, I was like, what the, what? And she was like, I'm doing this course. I had no money. I mean, I had no money at all. And um, cause I was, the contract fell through on my house the, the, the day before the signing. And I'd already quit my job. I'd already like, and I mean, I was like thinking one money. And anyway, River said, I'm doing this course. I said, I don't have any money. I can't, I, I'm, and she said, eh, let's barter. I made some, I was making jewelry to try to like buy propane for the heat for that farmhouse I was at. And, um, so I made jewelry, we, we bartered. And so I took this great course of that's how I met Susan Cushman. Time met Susan. That, and, and, and I'd, I'd heard of Suzanne Hudson, like I'd had, and Joe, but it's like, um, with Writers on Writing, I think, was that the anthology that Susan had ed edited? And anyway, she talked about that, and it's like, the world just opened up for me. So I cannot tell y'all how excited I am that 12 years later, I was the one that formatted and did the cover for this short story and kind of niched River along. Like, I thought, no, nah. it's like you talk about paying it forward. You know, it took 12 years for it to happen, but it happened. And I'm just so excited about it. I'm just I so love, happy. I love seeing you grow. I loved reading your stories that you would send to me that I would read. I love the, um, the relationship of people on those calls. You know, we first started doing them as conference calls early in the morning. And what an amazing thing to have you know, uh, when something is blessed, you know, that sent, I felt like those classes had that anointing, had a special anointing and the relationships. Virginia, it says Tina's iPhone, Virginia Dixon was also on those. And Mandy, you guys connected on Facebook. Yeah, yeah. That's how I met her. Yeah. So, you know, it was, I just love the way the universe brings people together like that, or God, God does, you know, in my world. That's the way I say it. But when you said that about your contract falling through, I have to tell you before I read an early writing story. When I wrote The Jane Girl, I did not have an agent and I sent it. And Virginia, you, you may know this story, remember? So I sent it myself to an independent publisher uh, that was a, a major independent located in Colorado, but a very respected. And she, the editor fell in love with the Jen girl. I'm living in my Airstream in the middle of the woods. I am writing on a card table, swear to God, plugged in, the computer plugged into a power pole because I got no I got no power to the Airstream other than the Airstream runs on its Airstream batteries, right? But so I've got a power pole like Green Acres for those of us old enough to remember Green Acres. And I am plugged directly into the power pole with a folding chair and a card table and a beach umbrella stuck in the dirt so that I can, the sun, you know, will cover the laptop and I can see it. And that's how I'm writing. And why I don't have a picture of that today, I don't know. You know, so um, I got an offer 
and was having to haul water up the hill to the woods, to the airstream, because there's no well. And I got an offer from this independent publisher for the Jane Girl for a $10,000 advance, which was a huge advance from an independent publisher. And I'm like, oh my God, I'm going to get a well, which was $3,000. And I was so excited. I was going to get that well, going to get that power, you know, pole run and connected so I didn't have to sit at that card table. And at the last minute, before the contract came through, another publisher came in and bought the independent publishing company and decided to take it in another direction and that my novel wasn't the voice that they wanted to publish. And after I'd been promised the $10,000 in the contract, you know, it was completely gone and it, it ripped the editor so bad she quit and she quit editing and she just left and she, she got another job. I mean, it just wrecked her as much as it wrecked me. And I remember lying in the dirt outside the airstream, looking up at the sky going, why God, why God, why? I just wanted a well, you know, I was so just flattened. Well, so okay, that, now that makes, that makes sense River because I, I'm living in this farmhouse now while my house that I'm still paying a mortgage on is getting these things fixed that needs because I have three dogs and they can't I can't do the work on the house. So I'm driving back and forth. I am sleeping. I closed off, put blankets up for one bedroom. I'm on an air mattress with a space heater because we're freezing because I can't afford the propane for this big farmhouse. But it was 70 acres. My dogs got to run. When when you said I want to do this for you, and I was like, but I haven't even been published. I had stories published, but I hadn't published anything yet. You said, no, Mandy, no, you are, you are a writer and I want to help you. Well, my, my mentor, when I was a young playwright, just a young thing of 25 or something, you know, when I went back to college and, and I'm laying on the floor in the classroom and I'm going, I, I just want to be a writer. I, I just want to be a writer. And she calmly looks at me and she goes, you are a writer. You know, and it's like, oh, okay, well, let me pick myself up and go write something and stop lamenting. You know, nobody laments like a writer, you know, oh my God, we can lament, you know. Uh, so anyway, I, I uh, you know, I, I also respect writers like Larry Brown and, uh, Oh my God, William Gay, who oh, yeah. was writing in his trailer somewhere, didn't even have a telephone, and somebody was trying to find him, and his daughter had to come to the trailer and go, there's somebody that's wanting to publish. Drywall. Huh? Hanging drywall. And, ju yeah, just, you know, there's, there to me, there's somehow some kind of you know, that word grit, you know, I know, or whatever. I, I Paying your dues is too easy. You know, there's some- Oh, I was just gonna some, say that. You're paying your dues, man. You know, there's something about that experience that works its way into the writing. Here's one of the things, Kathy, I said that you always thought Shelly said. We got it all the time. And Pat Conroy would call her River and call me Shelly all the time. I know. Uh, and, we, and we'd just say, hey, and we would just, we would just hey. roll. We would just roll with it, you know, okay, Pat, you know, whatever you want to call me is fine with me. But, uh, you know, and oh my God, he loved the public queens more than anything. And hearing him stand up there and go, this is what New York doesn't get this is what matters, you know. And, Don't make me cry. And, and then him coming back and bringing his best friend. What was his best friend's name? That oh, Bernie. 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 So crazy. He's like, Bernie's got to see this. Bernie's got to be here. So he comes back next year and he brings, he goes, I got to warn you, Bernie will say anything. You can't, you can't, you can't mask his mouth, you know, but he's like, I got to bring Bernie back, you know, I, I just, it's <laughs> of, of all people, oh my God, Pat Conroy, you know, um, the greatest of the greats, falling in love with the public queens and, and not just coming once, 
coming back because he loved it so much. Uh, just, and of course, his, his beautiful daughter, Melissa Conroy being there and me having their children's book that I read over and over to, you know, um, you know, what is the name of it? Poppy's what is the name? Pants. Poppy's Pants. Oh, Poppy's Pants, man. The Adorables. That was one of their favorite books. I just read it over and over and over. And I had the signed edition from Pat Conroy and Melissa both, you know. So uh, there was something else I was going to say about that. I, I was, you know, it's. So I, I was thinking about Rick Bragg. And a, nobody does it like Rick Bragg or ever will. There was this woman in a wheelchair I saw wheel up to him and said, I just want to climb you like a tree. And, uh, and she said, if I just lay down, will you just talk pretty over me? <laughs> <laughs> and I, you know, he's the Elvis of the written word. He really is. You know, just something about him. People wanted to lock up his hair or just to touch his shirt. You know, uh, so um yeah, still he's good and still and still do god bless him long live Rick Brown forever you know but there's something about that truth of growing up with that sort of um reality of of the deep south and maybe the poor south or whatever you know that that infuses the writing uh in such a beautiful way to me and and I said, you know, this was an original thought of mine, but I, I love writers from everywhere. And I said, when I when I read writers from up north, you know, I kind of automatically say New York writers and they're not all from New York, but it's like I can hear their brains ticking. They're so smart. But when I read these Southern writers like Larry and William Gay and Rick oh, Brown, gosh. I can feel their heart beating. And so um, to me, that's that's the difference between, you know, that's that deep South, you know, is you can feel the heart beating and the writer and the words and in the story, you know, and um, I, I think it kind of sets us apart a little bit in a beautiful way, you know? Um, so anyway, all right, guys, I know it's getting late, so I'm going to have to read to you so that you can go to bed or go watch, uh, station 11, um, <laughs> which some of us have watched three times, uh, not saying who, but, um, let me, anybody watching station 11 besides me? No, right now we're under a tornado warning. Whoa. Well, I'll, I'll read you through it. Do you need to go get in a bathtub or something? No, no. It It's the area that they're reporting around us, around Huntsville, more than Decatur proper. But, you know, I've, I've learned to just roll I with it. I'm so tired of it. I don't mind hurricanes at all because I grew up on the Gulf Coast, right? And I was used to them no matter what. Uh, I hate tornadoes. I just cleared out the closet under my stairs uh just so i could try to get somewhere mm -hmm. safe because i don't i don't have a storm shelter or basically the way our house sits it's kind of down a little bit lower than the rest of the neighborhood and other people have trees you know limbs blown down and stuff our yard's clear it's like dang <laughs> i'm up so, on the hill i'm on the hill I'm yeah the you're on the hill place. you're on the yeah, hill all right. <laughs> I'm in the good place for the flood, which is yeah. part of where Muddy Grace came from. But um, OK, so, I, you know, I'm just going to read a few, if you don't mind, opening paragraphs. Can we just do that? Yep. Just do a couple of different yes. opening paragraphs. Sure. Right. All right. So this is from Truth Be Told. Oh, damn, baby. The only mercy in the killing that I can grant to God is that it was quick. It is the only grace that keeps me on speaking terms with the Almighty. But I've told him on more than one occasion, wrong choice you made there. You took the good and left the line. I was no good, prone to trouble. I would be due a killing myself for what would come later, for the choices I would make. But here I stand to this day on solid earth. After so much time and years gone by, truth could have walked on water. In 1953, my twin sister, Truth, was electrocuted while standing next to the clothesline. 
I remember a sudden bright flash in her eyes looking at me as she was falling. I rushed to her and took her in my arms and I brushed her hair back from her face, closed her eyes and kissed her cheek goodbye. Her skin tasted like gunpowder. Me and Truth rode into this world together, head to foot, center and saint. Me being first, all fire and fury. Her second, silent and kind to the heart. There were transgressions from the start. Our father gone missing. Our mama left alone to deliver us from between her legs, half lying and half sitting with her teeth gone to grit. She chipped one in the doing of it that was never fixed. My part in that was all the pain and push. Mama said I come out hot to the touch, scared her some, not natural. That can't be so, I think, but she says it and it's the way she remembers and that with eyes wide open and not a cry to my lips, I reached out all at once, not to find her breast, not to find a mother's touch, was truth I searched for. My little fist flying wild, but once it found Truth's cheek, she said my fingers uncurled and rested there. And then I closed my eyes and grew still. Truth, she said, had come out shivered with skin casting blue. Her eyes closed to see and like a baby resting sweetly in her dreams. It was just before daybreak when we arrived, the air a heavy foggy mist. Mama had swaddled us and then walked to the pump to bring up water, her blood still running between her legs. She set it to warm on a gas stove to wash us up and then began to nurse us while she sat up, dozing in and out of pain that finally eased up from the cramping. He showed up sometime later then, looked at us without a word, and then went to the kitchen to get himself a cold biscuit and chicken leg. He ate it standing up, I was told, watching Mama sitting up in bed with me in the crook of one arm and Truth in the other. He never offered her a bite. Truth was made of light and wonder. There was a way of being that came easy for her, for Truth, that was just how she was made. It seemed as if I had sucked the mean from Mama's bones in the making and left all that was good for my sister. Now her and what she carried is lost to us. It changed me. Her dying did. She had kept me tethered to what was right, and she was gone. So that's a little bit from Truth Be Told and the opening of that story. And um, where'd you go, Mandy? Uh, Dog. So when she says, <laughs> and I'm just going to give you a little clue, a clue here, like Easter eggs and Station Eleven for people who would have not watched it yet shame shame but um so when she says he showed up later and um if you'll remember in sugar baby uh he lives down there he lives down there by that creek uh with his neck still scorched from that hanging that oh my god death. Yeah. I love you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's it's going to be a glorious thing when it comes into fruition. Um, if I die before it's written, you guys just talk about it like it was done. You know, or just you know. send me send me your damn notes, and I'm gonna make sure it gets done if you die before. <laughs> that's a good that's a good point. Uh, then glorious hanging a good Molly Brown. Good Molly Brown hanged herself from her porch railing on Black Friday. It was a gray overcast day with not a spit of a cloud in the sky, a world that appeared to be completely without a wit of hope or harness of compassion. The perfect weather was just a side note, a factor of cosmic cooperation. This act had been planned, considered, reordered, dated, and looked forward to. The ending of things known, the beginning of the great mystery, a trip without baggage, no wings required. So anyway, that's the opening of the inglorious hanging of good Molly Brown. Um, all right, <clears throat> priceless. So I'm gonna let you go soon, I swear to God. Running out of wine, gotta go. Okay, so. <laughs> 
J. Jacob Riley planned his heist for three months. He traveled all road by the way of a full moon, his shovel over one shoulder, a sack slung over the other. It rattled inside with the tools he brought for the work of it, a small pickaxe, a crowbar, a sturdy length of rope. He wore no gloves, even in the early winter snap. He was an outside man and was used to the troubles of weather. He wasn't a brave man, just a decided one. He whistled as he walked to give himself the courage to keep to his business, anything to keep his feet from turning around. It was a sad old tune that his ma had sung, her long gone to him now, but the melody remained for his lifetime. It had once been popular upon its time, but the old folks who knew it were long gone and the world had shifted forward under his feet. The headstones in the graveyard came into view and they glowed by the light of the moon. It scared him some in this time of the night, but he didn't think of it as a sad place. The sight of his bed empty, his plate waiting, his table set for just one. These were sad things, but here, while well, at least each dead one had another, they had this in common, all of them buried at odd angles, but still planted proper. This stayed the same. They could count on being dead. When times were uncertain in the world, they had this abiding rest on which to rely. Being dead was their only job. So it's a little bit from priceless. And I'm going to do the last one. I'm going to jump over to uh, no, no, Night Moves, I think. Yeah, we'll just, we'll just do just a couple since this one's set in Nashville, and then I'll, then I'll call it quits. It all started with the dead man and the scent of blue agave. A wicked blue cloud that wafted through the ancient graveyard, spinning webs and casting spells as it left a trail of sex and lies and promises. The Dea de los Muertes party began in the late afternoon shadows of the oldest burial grounds of the city. As if on cue by some mystical director, a fog moved in from across the Cumberland River and slowly threaded its way through a group of skeletons shaking their tambourines. Drummers and dancers twirled in the company of crypts and headstones. The tequila flowed like water. So it's just a little bit from, a little bit from, a little bit from, yeah. So, um, oh my God, guys, it's been so good to be with you. Is there anything else you want me to read or any answers I need to go or? Well, um, we've got to, we've got it. We're way over, but River, we're looking forward to tomorrow. And you just do not know what I may post tomorrow because things keep popping up. So keep sharing those stories and everybody, you know, shout this was, shout I out. have to say, it was so much fun to share the haunted house, fat back, pinned in my dress, hanging upside down. And so I've got to tell everybody, if you read that story in the blog, do you know what happened to... Uh, the Pride House? No. Mm. You don't know? No. no. It burned to the ground. Are you serious? <laughs> it was the first bed and breakfast in Texas, and it burned mysteriously to the ground. And the, the story in Jefferson is that when the firefighters got there and the people came to watch, they saw a man running down the staircase on fire as the house burned down to the ground. It still gives me chills, wow. but it's an, the little house behind it's still there, River, but the yeah. Pride House is no longer. Wow. And Sandy, did Sandy own it when you were there? I think so. She was the one that goes, I won't stay here. Are you sure you okay? I'm not gonna so, stay here, I gotta go. <laughs> my daughter used to help her, you know, at the bed and breakfast, you know, iron napkins and change beds and things. And she said that the, the, they had a record player that would come on all by itself and play songs. And she said it, it was really creepy. But um, yeah, so you weren't joking when you said that place was probably haunted, but it was, uh, it burnt, it's no longer there. It's completely gone. So 
Did you ever go back to Jefferson? All the couple of queens that shared their Jack Daniels with me that night before I got there, so that I could somehow contortion this. I my remember way that, that that pink prom dress or whatever she found. <laughs> That's Shelly. She's a trip, man. But yeah, anyway, uh, we look forward to tomorrow for the Pulp Thank Queen Presents. She's blogging all week. If you have any burning questions, uh, jump on board. We're having a lot of fun. So thank you all. Tina, thank you. Jim, Kelly, Mandy, Betty, Robert, Jacob for joining River and I. And congratulations today on your book launch for uh, the Cicada yes. Tree. And we'll all leave tonight with our, we've got to do a poster of this. This has just got to be a poster. So night, everybody. And River, the girls and I are coming to have drinks and a lunch with you at least. Come on, come on, come on. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll arrange it. All right. Okay, everybody. Bye. Bye. See you tomorrow. I can't do it with that thing over my eye. <laughs> Bye. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.